Good evening. I can't do it as good as that guy on the screen. Um, I'm Dee Dee Dunphy. I'm an advisory board member of Reflecting, Sharing, and Learning, a program series here at the library, uh, which brings monthly programming for baby boomers and other um, adults. If you're interested in finding out about more of the programs and about us, please take um, one of these brochures, the pink ones up at the front, um, and to sign up for the monthly newsletter. And if you can do us a favor, also please take a time to fill out this survey form so we can um, help grow our programs and um, you know help us, if you can help us with future programming, that would be great. Um, I look forward to this each Halloween, um, but this year it's kind of fun because my favorite book is 200 years old, Frankenstein, then written by 19-year-old Mary Shelley, so yay! <laughs> so I'm delighted to be kicking off the fifth annual Spooky Stories for Grown-Ups. Oh God, are we grown-ups, I guess so. Uh, for Grown Ups program, Listening in the Dark on Haunted Hill. Um, we've got five very talented raconteurs spinning scary stories tonight. Um, I'm going to give you the lineup and then I'll let them um, take the stand here. Um, going first this year is Joy Ovington, the Library Systems Operation Manager and self professed crazy cat lady. She's a professional actor who enjoys working with the local theater companies and singing in choruses and, of course, spending time with the cats. <laughs> Donna O'Kelly Butler serves as branch manager of the Bogart Library where she entertains and enlightens hundreds of patrons, school children, and teachers with her renditions of folk tales, legends, myths, and historical tales. This is Donna's fifth listening in the dark. That's right. Um, Paul Gilbu is a professor of entomology at UGA, an experienced storyteller, telling tales at Rabbit Box and coming in second in the Moth Radio Hour um, Story um, Slam. He is also a stand up comic around our Athens area. Kelly McLon. Fields, if I'm pronouncing that right, is a veteran both to storytelling and to the stage, having performed with Town and Gown, Rose of Athens, the Georgia Renaissance Festival, and many others, even a zombie movie. She is the best known as a children's storyteller, Grandmother Goose, but tonight she's going to give us a fright for a story for grown-ups. Again, we're grown-ups. Jacqueline Jackie Elsner will follow Kelly. She enjoyed over 40 years of library storytelling before her retirement from Athens Regional Library System in 2014. 2013, she won the Community Four-Way Test Award for Outstanding Service to Our Community by the Rotary Club of Oconee County. Uh, we'll wrap up with Eddie Whitlock who manages the library store here and coordinates volunteers for athens Clark County Library. He is the author of two books, Evil is Always Human, 2012, and POTUS of the Living Dead, 2014. And he hosts the After the End Book Discussion Group. So now will you help me welcome Joy um, to the stage. Good evening. <laughs> I shall get it too. <laughs> you may recall last year I ended by telling you about a haunting here at the library. My late kitty cat Adelaide. I told you that if you happen to see her, uh, she just wants to say hi. But the slide didn't work, so I just want to make sure that you know what she looks like. <laughs> so if you see her, let me know.
big ones, claws, right across the basement door that led up into Anna Eaton's kitchen. Meow, he roared. Anna stroked her other cats as she tore open the packaged cat food and filled the bowls that lined the kitchen wall. Then she hurriedly opened small cans of turkey, salmon, and chicken and topped the bowls with the cat's special treats. They began to gobble the food at once. Meow, Big One repeated, still scratching the door. The meowing and the scratching on the basement door rem reminded Anna that her favorite cat hadn't been fed yet. Big One didn't eat as often as the others, but his appetite was ferocious once he began to get hungry. Be patient, Big One, she called. I'll see that you get your favorite treat soon. Big One began to purr. Anna was glad he was happy. It wouldn't be wise to keep him waiting too long. Anna took especially good care of her cats. She lived alone, so she had plenty of time to spoil them. Anna knew that people talked about her, but she didn't care. She knew they said she cared more about her cats than she did people, and that <laughs> she spent more money on them than she did herself. She saw nothing wrong with it. Her greatest pleasure was to watch her cats eat, especially big one. Anna didn't know where big one had come from. He had appeared at her door one stormy night when she was very lonely. So she brought him in and she fed him, and since that night, he had been her closest companion, and she had taken great satisfaction in providing him with a proper diet. She'd found out quite by accident what he preferred. It wasn't always easy to obtain the kind of food he wanted. Sometimes it required a great deal of planning and effort. She couldn't let him out to hunt his own food. He was much too rare. Somebody might take him away from her. She kept him locked in the basement, so nobody would know he was there. <laughs> Meow! <laughs> Screeched Big One, impatiently scratching the door again. All right, called Anna. I'll arrange for your treat right now. She hated to call on her neighbors and co-workers down at the office especially since they had made unkind remarks to her in the past. She needed help with her cats in order to make arrangements for Big One, though, and she had no other choice. She phoned her neighbor, Madeline Miller, first. Madeline Miller was the only one who had ever complained about the cats getting out. That had only happened once. When Anna had left the door ajar while she carried in groceries, two of the cats had slipped out and caught a bird. Madeline had made an awful row about it. She'd hit one of the cats with a rock. Anna hadn't forgotten. Madeline answered after several rings. Madeline, 
Anna said. This is Anna Eaton. I hate to impose, but there's something I simply have to do. And I was wondering if you would be kind enough to feed my cats late this afternoon. <laughs> Madeline hesitated. She didn't like cats. Uh, but she knew she hadn't been very nice to Anna that time for pets got loose. This would be a neighborly thing to do. And maybe it would make up for their differences in the past. Yes, said Madeline. I can do that for you. You're a dear to do it, said Anna. I'll have everything ready. The cats will be in the kitchen. Don't open the basement door. My steps are steep and dangerous. I'll leave the key under the mat on the porch. Bye. <laughs> Anna rushed about preparing for what she had to do. As soon as she hung up, Madeline was filled with misgivings. She didn't like going into the empty house alone, and she had no choice now. Anna was counting on her to feed the cats. So late that afternoon, Madeline went to Anna's house, just as she promised. She was hoping the key wouldn't be there, so she would have an excuse not to go in. But it was there, under the mat. As Madeline stepped inside, the cats immediately emerged from dark corners to greet her. They rubbed against her legs, eager for their dinner. Anna had set the food out and left written instructions. Madeline opened, uh, followed the instructions and opened the packages and cans and filled the bowls. And the cats rushed over and began gulping down the food. Madeline felt good about doing Anna a favor. She started to leave, but a sound came from behind the basement door and it stopped her in her tracks. Uh, Meow! Big One's voice boomed. I thought she left all her cats in the kitchen, Madeline said aloud. No! She heard again, and this time the meow was followed by frantic scratching at the door. A poor thing, thought Madeline. It smells the food and can't get to it. I bet Anna didn't know it was down there when she closed the door. No! Meow! said Big One louder than ever. Okay, okay, yeah, I'll let you out, said Madeline. Anna told me not to open the basement door, but I know she'd want me to feed you. The door was unlocked, so she pulled it open. She was face to face with the biggest cat she had ever seen. Madeline had only a second to stare at Big One. His dark, shadowy form leaped at her. She saw blazing green eyes and fiery red claws as sharp teeth tore into her flesh. <coughs> Screeched Big One, pouncing and pulling his prey down the basement steps to where Anna was waiting. Anna stood among the shadows in the far corner of the basement and watched with great pleasure as Big One finished his treat. She had done what she had to do. She had bags, a scrub brush, and a bucket of water in case she needed to clean up after Big One was through. <laughs> they always do what they're told not to do. <laughs> chuckled Anna. I warned her not to open the basement door. Big One swallowed his last bite, licked his paws, and meowed at Anna for more. Uh, you can't still be hungry, she said. He licked his paws again and stared at her. Well, okay, said Anna, uh, but just one more this week. You mustn't be greedy. Let's see now. Whom shall I call? 
She ran through a mental list of names and then remembered Edith Gorman. Mm. Down at the office, Edith would be perfect. Anna hadn't forgotten how she embarrassed her yesterday. When Edith answered the phone, Anna spoke in her friendliest voice. Edith, she said, this is Anna Eaton. I hate to bother you at home, but there's simple, something I simply have to do. And I was wondering if you could stop by on your way to work in the morning and feed my cats. Edith was a little surprised that Anna was asking her for a favor. Just yesterday, they'd had words over an office report that Anna failed to complete properly. And she had said some unkind things to her. She'd even called her stupid. She was sorry now that she'd been so hard on her. This would be a good way to make it up to her. <clears throat> yes, said Edith, I can feed the cats. <laughs> You're a dear to do it, said Anna. I'll have everything ready. The cats will be in the kitchen. Don't open the basement door. My steps are steep and dangerous. I'll leave the key under the mat on the porch. Bye. <laughs> Anna hung up the phone and hummed. As she cleaned the kitchen, she gathered a bag, scrub brush, and a bucket and took them to the corner of the basement. As evening shadows gathered, she turned out the upstairs lights, closed the basement door, and took her place beside big one in the darkness. She smiled and big one purred softly as she stroked him. Morning would come very soon. Oh, Van, I'm so sorry. I I better redraw. Um, I have to go. I'm so sorry. Excuse me. I just gotta go. Uh, oh, as tradition, you know, is always held here at the library. I want to make sure that you see my latest cat. <laughs> um, he's my favorite, and um, he's a real big one. So I'm gonna go, Van. I'm gonna. Um, Don't open the basement door, Eddie. <laughs> Don't.
don't even think My cat weighs 22 pounds. Okay. So that was Joy Ovington um, reading a story by the popular author and storyteller Roberta Simpson Brown, a.k.a. Queen of the Cold-Blooded Tales. Um, Joy is not plotting um, Eddie's imminent demise. And the cat on the screen was actually Joy's very, very sweet kitty, Elijah, and that is who is portraying Big One. Okay. Well, this is my fifth year of doing this. The first year, let's see, that was the serial killer year. And the second year, that was the uh, murderous bridegroom. The third year, um, what was the third year? Was, the, was that the, yeah, that was the woman buried alive. And um, last year it was the obsessive lover who tried to murder the two men who brought um, knowledge of her husband's death. This year I was thinking about doing something based on an Appalachian ballad um, called um, Fair and Tender Ladies and wrapping it up with the Telltale Heart. But somehow I thought I might go a little kinder and gentler this year because frankly the world's scary enough as it is without Halloween. Um, so this year I'm going to tell a story that's based on a Native American folk tale. Um, it, is, it is from southwestern um, Washington State, and there are several tribes that do tell the story. Um, my version is the woman who married a ghost. So kinder and gentler, but I promise there's no bloodshed like in previous years. <clears throat> there was once a chief who had three daughters, and all three were the light of his life. And though many young men came to court, he refused to allow any of them to marry. For frankly, he loved his family exactly the way it was. Now, if you refuse kindnesses and overtures enough, the gods and the spirits will come to hear of it. And one night, as all the people were dancing by the full moon, across the silver lake there came a party, not of warriors, but of singers and musicians. And out of the first canoe stepped a tall and handsome young man. He came to the chief and he spoke to him and he said, I realize that you love your daughters, but I wish a bride. And look at me, how wealthy I am, and see all the people who come with me, my entourage of braves and dancers and musicians. I plead with you, allow me to marry one of your daughters. Now, in custom, it was that the oldest daughter would be married first. And so she looked at the young man, and she looked at her father, and she said, Father, I do wish a family of my own, and I am willing to go with this young man. And so it was agreed that on the next full moon, the young man would return with all his followers, his entourage, and the two would be married, and she would return with him to his own land. Within a month, that is exactly what happened, the moon shone silver and bright, and it looked as though the lake itself was made of precious metal, glinting and sparkling with the moon trail. And across the mighty lake came the canoes loaded down with gifts, treasure of sorts, musicians, and of course, the handsome young man. Everyone danced and danced and danced. And as the moon was starting to crest, they turned, climbed into the canoes. The young woman said a tearful goodbye to her mother and family and the rest of her tribe and went with her husband. They crossed the lake 
still by moonlight and went into the most lovely village she could possibly imagine. She walked through rich fields to a beautiful lodge and inside it was decorated with the finest of furs, the softest of a bed made of furs, and the most beautiful thing, up above the ceiling was painted with stars and moon and beautiful, beautiful pictures. Everyone left the bridegroom and the girl together, and she was very happy to fall asleep in the arms of her new husband. In the morning, when the sun rose, the light came through the ceiling of the lodge, and it woke the young woman. Hmm, she thought, it is so late already. I must be up and prepare food for my new family. My father and my husband, my in-laws, father-in-law, mother-in-law, and the rest of the tribe. But she saw something strange. As she looked up at the ceiling, she saw that it was no longer a beautiful lodge. It was peeling and broken, and the sun was shining through cracks. And she noticed that the, the blankets of furs covering her husband were rotted. They looked like they had mange. They were hideous. And so she turned to say something. What happened to our beautiful lodge? Where are my furs, my treasure? And she saw that her husband was no longer a handsome bride, a handsome groom though she was still a beautiful bride. Instead, he was a skeleton with some bits of decayed flesh still attached. Oh, she said, I've married a spirit person. I've married a ghost. And she ran out of the lodge. And she was horrified to discover that all around her, the people who had been close to the lodge, the people, the musicians, the dancers, her in-laws, were not people at all, but skeletons. In horror, she dashed her way down to the shore of the lake. And as she did, she ran carelessly in her hurry to get away from the horrors surrounding her in the daytime. She knocked aside bones and skeletons until she arrived at the shore. And there were no fine canoes. Instead, they were only rotted husk. Oh, she thought. What have I done? If only I had stayed with my mother and father. And then she heard a voice. Child, it said. And when she turned around, she saw that there was one other living creature. An old, old woman. Now this was no ordinary woman. This was Screech Owl. She is a spirit person, as all the owls are. They are able to cross the line between the living and the dead. But whereas the ghost, the dead, are alive at night, the owl becomes an owl at night and a human in the day. And the girl said, what can I do? Will you help me get back to my father? And she said, I will, but you must understand. You will make the dead angry if you leave, for you have insulted them deeply and quite possibly have wounded many. But she agreed to help the girl. They patched together a canoe, and then Screech Owl flew, waving her wings to sail the girl across the lake. But that night, when the moon rose, not as full, but almost as it had been on the girl's bridal night, the canoes crossed the lake again. 
And this time, they did not come with gifts. Instead, they came with threats of war and death. The young brave, the young man, the young chieftain of the dead, the spirit person, stepped out on the shore and told the girl's father that if she did not return and pay penance, say she was sorry, then the dead would destroy their village and every one of you will join us, he said. And the girl agreed to return across the lake with her husband. She simply changed her attitude. In the night, she spent time with her husband and her in-laws and all of their friends, and she drew, grew to love them deeply. In the daytime, when they were skeletons, she slept. And after a time, a child was born to the young woman, a beautiful, beautiful boy. But because he was half spirit and half human, he was not entirely one of each. He was both. In the nighttime, he was a beautiful chubby baby reaching out for his mama and his daddy and chattering. In the night, in the daytime, his head was that of a child, but his body was that of a skeleton. As the child grew, the girl grew sad and said to her husband, I must take our child back and show him to my mother. It is what I desire. And he said, you may do that, but keep the child wrapped up for 10 days, for if you do not, he will remain as he is, half human, half spirit. Only unwrap him at night. In the day, keep him napping and tightly wrapped. The girl returned with her husband and all of her tribe, the tribe of death, and she stepped out and they returned in the moonlight. Her husband said, I will return in two weeks, but if you need me, call in the night time and I will hear you. Everything was fine for a while, but on the ninth day, in the daytime, as the girl slept, her mother unwrapped the sleeping baby. Ah! She screamed, the child's a and she dropped the baby, breaking some of its arms and legs. It was awful. Bones went everywhere. The girl woke up when she heard her baby cry, and she picked it up and wrapped it carefully and called for her husband to come and return and get her. But as she left, she told her parents, I and I alone will come and visit you every year. But remember, I am no longer just of the living. I am of the dead as well, for I love my husband, and I love my child, and I love my in-laws and relatives in the land of the dead. The girl did. She returned every year. But after a time, not as often. After five and then ten years, first every five years, then to ten, and then later, not so often, for she aged too. She was living in the land of the dead, but she was still human. Finally, when she had not returned for several years, she landed in her canoe on the village shores where she had grown up, and there was no one there. 
No one and all the lodges were tattered and torn. So she returned to the land of the dead and never left it again. But as she aged and as she died, she became completely a spirit person, as young and as beautiful as she was on her bridal day. And there she is still living with her husband and her beautiful child and all of their ghost and friends. I will uh, preface this story by saying my wife did not want me to do it because she felt that it vilified spiders and that spiders face enough prejudice as it is. I, I wanted to bring a live tarantula, but I made the mistake of asking permission. <laughs> and the library said, nope. And I said, what if it's a service animal? <laughs> and they said, don't please leave the spider at home. So I did not bring a spider. Um, well, we like spiders very much at my house. We don't kill spiders. And as you will see from this story, it can bring about bad karma. It's bad luck to kill a spider. Um, Frances Eleanor Key was known as Frankie to her friends, but the children at Westside Elementary preferred Freaky or sometimes Frankenstein, but they never, they never spoke these words where the teacher could hear them because uh, Miss Key was tall and she was big. She was not by nature of a stern disposition, but she was nonetheless an intimidating figure to a classroom of third graders. Uh, Frankie loathed spiders. She hated the little round bodied ones that built webs up near the ceiling. And she hated even more the hairy ones that walked along the ground. Nothing gave Frankie greater pleasure than to put her size nine practical black leather shoe on top of a spider and crush it out of existence. For many a spider, the shadow of Frankie's shoe was the last thing they ever saw. Uh, it was Friday afternoon, and Frankie was tired. The children always were rambunctious uh, when, as summer holiday approached. And at 4.15 promptly, she stepped out of her classroom. She locked the door, and she went out into the bright sunshine. As she got into the car, she thought about uh, what she needed from the supermarket. It was her book club night, and she was the host. And so she needed some fresh fruits and some cheese. And she said, I think I need something for my supper. And she said, oh, I need a light bulb. Because the bulb down into the basement where her laundry was, was out. And she refused to go down to the basement without the lights ablaze. Uh, she stopped by the supermarket and she drove home. She parked by the back door, went in through the kitchen, put her purchases uh, down on the counter, and the phone rang. And it was uh, her friend Suzanne, who was the president of the book club. And it was just text. And it said, uh, meeting canceled, sick child, sorry, S. And Frankie uh, liked book club very much, but she was pleased because uh, you know she didn't really want to tidy up the house on Friday night. But she, as she was uh, going down to the basement, it was dark. It was dark down on the steps. 
and she remembered what she had read about brown recluse spiders very clearly. It was on the internet and it said, the brown recluse is a large to medium spider. As its name implies, it hides during the day in dark places and it comes out at night to hunt. Brown recluse spiders are easy to identify if you examine them closely because they have six eyes and most spiders have eight eyes. The brown recluse bites can cause a necrotic lesion which grows and leaves a, mis a disfiguring scar. And this stuck with Frankie and it had changed her life. Her bed was at least two feet from every wall. The bed skirt was very short and around each leg of the bed she had wrapped some sticky paper that was sold to catch roaches. She had thought about a bed net, but she was so afraid that a spider might get into the bed net and she would be trapped in there with it that she decided against that idea. But as she went down into the basement to change the light, she remembered that uh, she could reach the light because she was a tall person. And if she put a sturdy wooden box on the third step, she could reach up and she could change out the bulb without having to drag the ladder out from the garage. So she found the box and she put it up on the step. And the clamor of the box and her stepping up on it disturbed a spider that was hiding on the steps. It was a wolf spider and it was a female and she was covered with baby spiders. And as Frankie stepped up into the box, the spider clambered up the side and it ran across Frankie's foot. Uh, Frankie noticed the movements and this spider crawling across her foot, writhing with babies, was more than she could take. And she began to flail away at the spiders and it upset the box and Frankie and the light bulb and the box and the spiders all fell heavily to the concrete floor below. Uh, Frankie was still wailing away at the spiders until she was confident there were none left and she took stock of her situation. Her hip was almost certainly broken and her shoulder was maybe out of joint. She could not rise you know, much less go up the steps. She could see the warm light from the kitchen and she remembered about her cell phone that was laying on the cabinet. But she could not reach either of them. And the sun was starting to go down. The shadows began to creep across the floor. And Frankie realized that no one, no one was coming. And she began to cry. At first it was just a few tears, but it grew into just heaving sobs. And these heaving sobs disturbed another spider that had been hiding under the washing machine. And it crept out to the edge of the darkness, its six eyes unblinking, waiting until it was dark enough to hunt. what I'm going to tell you is a family story. Now like most family stories, when they get handed down, they get rather embellished. So you will have to just decide which part of these, the story, is for real and which isn't. Have you seen the ghost of John? Long white bones and the skin all gone, wouldn't it be s creepy, scary, chilly, 
with no skin on. Years ago, my brother and his first wife and their two children lived in an A-frame house, a very lovely little house, in the middle of the country in South Georgia. It was really in the middle of nowhere. I, I went down frequently to visit, and um, a couple of the things that happened I actually saw. The way it started was that my brother would put a, a coffee pot on and it would wait and he would time it so it would go off when he got up in the morning. And he would fix it and then every morning when he'd get up, he'd come into the kitchen, the coffee pot would have been removed from the base and the coffee would be pouring onto the floor. Well, he had a great, um, uh, it was a, a large dog, and the dog was kind of dumb, frankly. But one day, and I was there for this one, one day, uh, the trash can flew across the kitchen and stuck to the wall. And the dog howled. And I saw it, and I pretty much howled too. <laughs> David said, oh, we just have a poltergeist. And I said, well, poltergeists aren't always that wonderful, but whatever. <laughs> then, then we noticed that down the hall, near their little girl's room, it was always just icy cold. It didn't matter winter, summer, or whenever it was. It was just so cold. And sometimes they'd go walk down there and they would hear their daughter singing and talking to someone. And she would say, when they asked her who it was, she would say, well, I was talking to the little boy. And they went, oh, all right. They thought she had an imaginary friend. The son came into the bedroom one night and said to them, why is mother up walking up and down the hall? And they said, mother's right here. I'm right here. Look. And they said, tell us about this woman that's walking up and down the hall. Oh, he said, she's got on a long blue dress. A long blue dress. And a funny kind of act like and she's looking for something well there was now we have a little boy who's talking to the little girl and a mother who's wandering in the hall one day this went on for some time and occasionally they would be really really frightened one day, um, they were on a long walk and they had gone into the woods on the other side of the highway and they discovered a tomb, a grave site. And apparently, when they read some of the tombstones, they realized that they possibly were on top of a Confederate grave site. There was there were one or two markers in the in the woods over there, and there was a marker for a woman and her little boy. And she, they began to think that maybe this was the person who was roaming their house. And things continued like this. One night, um, I was spending the night. And my brother was telling me that his wife was out of town and he, he, he was le leaned over and felt a pillow by her. He felt the covers move and there was a, he flicked on the lights because he knew she wasn't home. And there was the cover pulled back and an indentation of a head in the pillow. Well, he was pretty scared. And that wasn't all. 
His wife was in the shower one day in the back of the house. And all of a sudden, she felt a cold hand touch her face. She was so scared. The coldness, the wanderings in the hall, the poltergeist, all of that continued until one beautiful Easter Sunday when the house burned to the ground. The only thing that was saved in that house was a side table that contained boxes of pictures of the family. The fireman and then the inspector who came said that the only thing they could figure was that the house had been struck by lightning. And that's the end of my tale. So there's a full moon, y'all, and you're looking at it on the screen. The story I'm going to tell you is the dead moon, and it's from a county in England, Lancashire. Anybody visited Lancashire? I have not, so. Um, it's up in the northeast coast of England. It's uh, one county down from Scotland, and it has a lot of marshes that eventually got filled in. But and they call them the Fens. So, this is a story of the dead moon. And the people in Lancashire, the ones who worked in the Fens, were called the Cars. And they knew that you had to be very careful going out into the Fens and the bogs at night. Because it was, if it was dark, and in the dark of the moon, there were Boggles and witches and will of the wicks and all kinds of creatures. There would be harm and mischance and mischief, and you could you could lose your life there. You were walking over tussocks of grass with quaking earth on either side and deep pools of water, and you would hear noises like moans, and you would feel whisperings across your ears and down there at your ankles. And you simply knew that you could lose your life if you went walking in the bogs and the fens at night. Especially if it was the dark of the moon, the new moon. Well, the moon up in the sky, she kept hearing the people talk about this and she was really concerned because, you know, she shone down for the, the full moon weeks of the month and and she kept everyone safe. And she wondered, why, why was this going on? What, 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 was, what was happening down there in the fence? And she wanted to see if really what she was listening to, if it was true. And, and if it was, she wanted to see if she could help out. So, the moon wrapped herself in a black cloak all the way down to her feet. And she covered her shining yellow hair with a hood, and she stepped down out of the sky into the fence. And she had to be very careful because she could see as she looked on either side of the tussocks of grass, she saw the faces of dead creatures, dead people <coughs> looking up at her, and there were hands coming up out of the water to clutch at her, and there were boggles and there were witches riding on black cats, and there were will-o'-the-wicks with lanterns swinging on their backs. And the moon had only the light that was coming from her feet, which were peeking out from her black cloak, to find her way from one tussock to the next. And she could smell the gases coming up out of the bogs, and she knew what the people were talking about was absolutely true. She could hear it all, and smell it all, and see it all. And there were things grabbing at her ankles, 
And, and she walked as lightly as she could, as lightly as the sun in summer. And the wind is, would go across the grass. But as careful as she was, she got to one stone and it turned under her foot. And she stumbled. And as she stumbled, she reached out with her hands. And she grabbed at a snag. It was a black snag. And as soon as she grabbed that snag and caught her balance again, that snag wrapped around her wrist just like handcuffs. And no matter how she pulled, that snag had her hands. And she yanked and she twisted and she turned and she could not free her hands. She pulled and she did everything she could. She was crying out into the dark to see if anyone was there and would help her. And she was stuck and she was trapped. But as she looked around, she could see a, a, some other, something else was moving in the bogs and the fens. And, and then she heard, oh my goodness, it was a man. And he was splashing across and he was crying. And he, she heard him moan and, and he was crying out piteously. He was saying, oh, help me, help me, Jesus and Mary and Joseph, help me, help me, show me the way. And he would scream and screech, and then he'd sob. And she heard him, and she saw he was going from one tussock to the next, and what he was doing was following the will of the wicks and the lanterns that were swinging on their backs that were leading him deeper and deeper into the bog. And if he stepped, he would be sunk right down and never, ever come back up. He was screaming and moaning. And the moon was watching him and thinking, oh, someone has to help this man. And her hands were still caught. And she kept yanking and tugging. And she was thrashing about so much that the black hood over her golden hair was thrown back. And then all of a sudden, this beautiful yellow light shone across the box. And the man said, oh, oh there, there's the way. And, and she saw that now he was finding his way to the solid path. And he was making one foot in front of the other solidly and crying and weeping and thanking whoever it was and looking around and finally making his way to safety. But the moon was caught. She was snagged. She was cuffed. There was no getting out of this grip. She could not break it. And she tossed and she yanked and she threw herself around until she used all her strength. And as she was tugging, all these dead things were coming up out of the, the bog. And they were laughing at her. And not only were her hands caught, but they were grabbing at her ankles and pulling at her black cloak. She was thrashing about till finally she had used all her strength and she fell face forward in the mud. She was trying to pull her head back to get some air when all these creatures, these boggles and these witches and these dead things and these hands grasping her, they all started dancing all around her. They now had the moon in their grasp. When she shone those two weeks of every month, all the people, they could find their way to safety and they had no one to grab and no one to frighten and no one to pull down into the depths. But now they had the moon in their power. And they all started hollering, what were they going to do? And the witches said, see this, you have been spoiling our spells for years. We have you now. And all the boggles said, yes, yes, yes. We're tired of everything. We have to scurry away into corners and hide when the light comes out. And all the will of the wicks, they said, oh, and you thrash our lanterns. We can't even know where we're going to scare anyone because you're here. Oh, the witches said, I know I'm going to be a poisoner. I'm going to poison the moon. That's what we'll do. <laughs> oh, they love that idea. And, and then the Bible said, no, no, we're going to smother her. We'll push her down and we'll smother her. 
That sounded great. And then the will of the wick says, no, 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 no. I'm going to strangle her. And, and they reached up their hands like this and grabbed her throat. Oh, the moon was terrified. There was no one she could call out to. There was no one to save her. And all these creatures, they danced and they shrieked all around her and they argued all through the night until the first gray light of dawn was coming. And they, oh, oh, they, they were terrified. They had to sh shriek back into their holes because as soon as light, daylight came, they couldn't be in the box. So they said, we're going to bury her. And the witches, they thrust her head way, way down in the water. And the Bibles, they got this great, huge stone, and they rolled it over there. They stomped it right on top of the moon. And they set two of those will of the wicks. They said, okay, you're going to guard the moon. You keep those lanterns on your back, and you make sure somebody's here at all times. So that moon never comes up. We've buried her dead. And no one knows where to look. that was the way it was. Well, the people in the village, they were waiting for the beautiful full moon to come back. Oh, they put pennies in their pockets and straws in their caps and it was going to be the beautiful moon again. And every day went by and the beautiful moon never returned. And not only did the beautiful moon never return, but oh my God, all the witches and the boggles and the will of the wicks, they came shrieking out at night. They would peek through the shutters of their windows and they'd peek in and they'd come to the door latch and they'd look in like this and they would scream and screech all around to where people were too frightened to even leave their homes at night. They had to keep the fires going in the hearth all night long because these evil things were creeping up over into the threshold and they were coming inside. What were they going to do? Well, they needed help. So they thought to go to the wise woman who lives in the mill. And they go to her. And, and they tell, where can we find the moon? Why is the moon not coming back? We never have the full moon, the beautiful moon. We never see it. We're terrified. Well, the wise woman, she looked in the brew pot. And she looked in the Bible book, and she looked in the mirror, but it was all dark. I see nothing, I see nothing, she said. It's as dark as it can be. You're going to have to keep asking all around and listen to people and talk and talk among yourselves. You must bring me back something, some information. But in the meantime, you keep the straw in your cap and you put salt on, the, on your hearth, on your, your threshold, because salt is going to keep you alive to the end of your days. They knew something we don't believe in now. And you put a button in your pocket and you put a button on your threshold and that will keep the evil things away. Well, you can believe they talked. You can believe everywhere they went. They wondered, do you know anything? Do you know anything about the moon, where the moon could be? Well, they talked in their homes. They talked at the inn. They talked at the garth. Finally, one night, there was a stranger. He lived way across the other side of the bog land. And he was by himself. And all of a sudden, he just kind of sits bolt upright and he slaps his knee. And he says, oh, I know. I know where the moon is. Oh, I tried to forget it. It was weeks and weeks and months ago. I was lost out in the fens. I could not see for anything. I was stumbling from one tussock to the next. It was dark. I was going to sink into the quick. And I was crying.
crying out for any kind of help. And all of a sudden, there was this beautiful golden light that just streamed across the fence. And I could see my way clear. It was clear as day. And I found my way to the hard path. And I got back home. And, and I, I was so happy to be saved and to be on firm ground that I barely looked. But when I, when I did turn around to see where was this light coming from, that there was this beautiful golden light. And there was this gorgeous face, like a round face smiling. I think there was something like a snag it was standing in front of. That's just what I remember. Maybe that will help. So, people went back to the wise woman in the mill. They told her what this man had said. She listened. She went back and looked in the brew pot. She looked in the mirror. She looked in the book. She said, I'm seeing a little something. It's still dark, but I think I can help. Here's what you must do. You must go back out into the fens at night. You must go all together. You must put a stone under your tongue. You must carry a hazel twig. And you must say not one word from the time you enter the bog until you return home. But you are looking for a coffin and a cross and a candle out there in the bog. And when you find it, you drop to your knees, you've got that stone under your tongue, say not one word out loud. But you pray thou Father forwards for the cross. And then you pray it backwards against the boggles. And then you lift up that stone. Say not one word. And then you come back home. And I think we'll be safe. Oh, they were so afraid. They looked at one another and said, Who's going to go? We and the wise woman in the, in the world, she said, I don't care if you want to go or not, but you're going to be stuck being terrified the rest of your life if you don't go and do what I tell you. So, the next night, the men of the village, they got together. They put that stone under their tongue. Every one of them had brought a hazel twig. And they knew what they had to do. And it all began by being quiet. And they stumbled out into the fence. They were terrified. There were dark hands clutching at their ankles. There were dead things leering at them out of the water. There were shrieks in the wind that whistled by their ears. It all sounded like it was ready to grab them down into that water and they would never come back up. But they kept going and going. Finally, they did see something. They saw something. It looked like a big old black snag that was just cross enough. Might be a cross. There was a long stone. It could be a coffin. And there was one little light glimmering on it. You'd have thought it was like a candle. They dropped to their knees. They said, Our Father forwards for the cross without a word spoken. They said, The Our Father backwards against the boggles without a word spoken. And then the biggest of those men. They grabbed the head of that big stone and they yanked it up. And when they did, there was this beautiful light that came shining about. And they looked down and there was a face, a beautiful smiling face, a glorious golden smiling face of the moon. And then it shot straight up into the sky. And there was the full moon shining over. Those men, they got back to the village. They had their moon back again. The full moon was back. Everyone was safe. And you know, the, 
the moon always shines the most beautifully over the fens in Lancashire. Because she remembers that it was the car man who went out and looked for her when she was dead and buried. And no one knew where to find her. And she knew she would stay and keep them safe at every cycle of her full moon. And that's that. First, some quick notes. Uh, this is not the story that was mentioned in the Red and Black article. Uh, I didn't like the ending of that one, so I wrote this one yesterday. The story is titled Old Monsters and is my homage to the Universal Studios horror movies. I grew up watching those on the local show, The Big Movie Shocker with Bestoint Dooley. And in reading this, come on, man. In reading this story, I'm going to try to do three different voices. The normal voice, which is also the voice of Larry Talbot, the Wolfman, a gruff voice for the Frankenstein monster, and an accented voice for Count Dracula. Uh, this voice, unfortunately, sometimes drifts into being the same voice that Mel Brooks did for the 2,000-year-old man. So bear with me if the voice suddenly is verklempt. He had long ago given up on being called Adam, which was the name he wanted to be called. He had never cared for being called the creature. To call him Frankenstein's monster seemed a bit much, so he had given up and accepted people were going to call him Frankenstein. He was living out his days, if you could call it living, at the Universal Studios Home for Aging Monsters in New Smyrna Beach, Florida. The residents called it by the acronym USHAM. All in all, it was a decent place to spend one's final years. When Frankenstein entered the facility in 1970, Dracula had already been there 10 years. The Wolfman, in his form as Larry Talbot, joined them in 2004, age having reduced the once threatening lycanthrope to a howling, yapping shadow of his former self. Fourteen years later, they were preparing to celebrate Halloween, something the staff at Universal Studios Home for Aged Monsters overdid every year. Viva once great and horrifying figures, said Dracula, bringing terror to the masses. Now they are old and feeble. The only one I scare now is that poor orderly who fears the day I become incontinent. <laughs> the three of them sat at the table of honor in the dining hall. It was the same table they ate at every day, but tonight the table was covered with orange plastic and decorated with ominous black candles shaped like human skulls that could not be lit because of fire code. <laughs> I wish I were dead, said Larry Talbot. <laughs> it's over reading, said Dracula. Other patients were arriving now, pausing to pay nodding respects to the three kings of horror. The mummy snubbed them always resentful that he had not been given the status of the other three. A monster who could not speak, though, was limited in dramatic situations. <laughs> the mummy took his seat at a side table along with the creature from the Black Lagoon. They were a couple now, although the mummy's religious upbringing prevented his being able to publicly admit and celebrate this. The other monsters were supportive of him, but believed that his coming out was his own decision. <laughs> Invisible man here, asked, Dr asked Frankenstein. I haven't seen him, said Larry Talbot. <laughs> Dracula groaned. I could die right now if it would never hear that joke again. <laughs> A variety of female monsters also arrived. When the bride of Frankenstein came in, shuffling her walker alongside one of the brides of Dracula, there was a tension in the air that was palpable. She approached the table where the three monsters sat, Pointed, her, pointed at her ex and hissed. <laughs> she then shuffled off to the table decorated in her honor at the far corner of the dining hall. 
Bride of Frankenstein, never like me, Frankenstein said, me doomed to bachelor life. I had many brides, said Dracula, and I can remember each one of them. There were these three sisters in a private ceremony in Minsk in 1740. Please, Dracula, said Talbot, spare us. We don't need to hear more stories of what a Casanova you were back in the day. Casanova, said the Count, he was a pale imitation of me. Just then, Quasimodo arrived, one of the few residents at Yushim who had a spouse. The beautiful, spot, the beautiful wasp woman walked by his side. What does she see in him? asked Dracula. I have a hunch, said Talbot, that he rings her bell. The three chuckled at that, though again it was the same joke they had told many times. If we had accepted women monsters better, said Talbot, maybe things would have turned out differently. Frankenstein wanted to accept bride, said Frankenstein. She, you saw, she not accept Frankenstein. And once I had a daughter, the daughter of Dracula. Frankenstein and Talbot looked at each other and shook their heads. Talbot said, you know, Dracula, she wasn't your kid. But... I mean, think about it. She was a vampire, sure, but her mom was a vampire. Yes, said Dracula pensively. Go on. Renfield, said Frankenstein. Bad. He did air quotes. Protected Dracula. The monster raised his eyebrows and shook his head. Renfield, not Dracula's friend. Dracula reflected on the statement. She had green eyes. Nobody in my family had green eyes. Renfield had green eyes. Sorry, man, said Talbot. We should have probably told you before. I'm a 1,400-year-old vampire. I should have put two and two together. <laughs> Today Halloween, said Frankenstein. Monsters try to be happy. Just then, the night's program began. As always, Dr. Jekyll attempted to do stand-up comedy, but his timing was terrible. The Phantom of the Opera then sang Try a Little Priest from the musical Sweeney Todd. The witch, Ange the witch Angelique joined him for the duet. When the song was done, dinner was served, prime rib rare, broccoli and rice pioff. Talbot growled at his plate, noticed, noting, this beef is too rare. I'm a werewolf. I'm not a barbarian. <laughs> Enjoy it all you can, said Dracula. I'm on the liquid only diet. This was supposed to be a joke, but it was also true. The cafeteria worker who had served plates to the other two had attached an IV drip to the count. Frankenstein only poked at his food, agreeing with Talbot about the prime rib. Frankenstein, see cows burned worse, get well. Frankenstein. During the meal, a string quartet played a selection of music from modern horror films, including the theme from Baba Duke, a crowd favorite. The next part of the program was traditionally a speech by the CEO of Universal Studios, currently a position held by Ronald Meyer. Last year's speech, entitled We All Want to Make Money, had been a YouTube sensation, although the film version suggested that the speech was being made before a group of costumed partygoers and not real monsters. The Dapper executive was not present at tonight's gala, however. Jennifer Meyer, the CEO's daughter, sat there instead. She had been named the director of USHAM at the July meeting of the board of directors. She had promised to bring financial stability to the organization. Just because our residents are scary does not mean our annual report should be, she said. Tonight would be her first report to the residents. She stepped up to the podium, adjusted the microphone, <clears throat> cleared her throat, and said, I am here tonight with bad news. When the Universal Studios Home for Aging Monsters was created in 1936, the life expectancy for monsters was much lower. We anticipated that few monsters would actually wind up here. Most would have individual retirement plans that would allow them to live out their days. She was interrupted by a shout from a nameless girl, Get to the point! Tonight it is with a heavy heart that I announce that the Universal Studios Home for Aging Monsters will close at the end of the year. Shrieks of pain and terror arose from the crowd. A constant screech of why, why, why? The woman at the microphone replied, 
cuts to Medicare, Medicaid, housing grants, support services, it's all made it impossible for us continue, to continue. All of you are going to need to find new homes. We'll be closing these doors at midnight, December 31st. The protest of screams of the residents rose as the young woman left the podium and exited the room toward her waiting limousine in the parking lot. Apparently the staff was also surprised by the news and they themselves were upset and confused. There was a great gnashing of teeth, fang, and claw that went on for almost an hour. More than once the exchange being heard, I told you to vote, but her emails. <laughs> the evening ruled, the monsters soon began to make their way back to their rooms for the night. They would need to begin looking for new accommodations tomorrow. They had 61 days. Frankenstein, Larry Talbot, and Dracula remained seated at their table of honor until they were the only ones left in the room. What Frankenstein going to do? Frankenstein's monster lamented. Family castle long gone because of property taxes. As is mine, said Dracula. The Talbot family had an estate, but well, we had some legal troubles. And let me tell you, Dracula, your race has nothing on the legal profession. Anyhow, the old family estate is now a bed and breakfast. They were quiet for a few minutes before Dracula said, Even if you were able to find places to go, I don't suppose we will be together. Cutbacks are breaking up this old gang of mine. Frankenstein had also been thinking about the situation. He told Dracula and Talbot, Meet Frankenstein in outdoor recreation area in ten minutes. We bring refreshments. The other two monsters nodded and left the dining hall. A waning crescent moon had risen over the pickleball court. Dracula was seated on a bench there yawning when Larry Talbot walked out. Beside him, Frankenstein carried a tray with a bottle of cognac and three glasses. Talbot took a seat beside the count, his arthritic back creaking audibly. Frankenstein put the tray on a table and began pouring. I love a drink, vine, said Dracula. Give it a rest, Val, said, Tal said Talbot. I never drink vine. Nobody believes that. We've all seen the special deliveries that go to your room. <laughs> Sometimes, admitted the, the count. I do have a small glass of vine. It helps me sleep. Do you know how difficult it is to sleep in the daytime? Let me tell you, very difficult. And you would begrudge me a glass of wine? What kind of monster are you? Have drink, Frankenstein said. Frankenstein, not judge. The three of them sat quietly, sipping their cognac. Finally, Talbot said, You fellows have any idea what to do? Dracula said, No matter what, I will not be rebooted. I refuse. I would rather turn to dust in the dawning sunlight. Agree, said Frankenstein. We not want to prostitute self further than already been done. Frankenberry cereal. Capitalism is real, monster. Even a man who is pure of heart and yada 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 said Talbot, I don't want to be a toothless balding werewolf wondering where his next meal is coming from. I should have never let myself be put into a nursing home, said Dracula. I should have died the way I lived, in a matter of speaking. I should have scared the big Jesus out of people until someone drove a stake through my heart. Mmm, Frankenstein, thank count had a good point. Monsters should not go gentle into that good night. Talbot nodded and then drank down a second shot of cognac. What say we leave this place and hit the streets, fellas? By the time morning comes, we'll be dead, but we'll have a hell of a time. Dracula smiled, his own fangs glistening in the moonlight. I like the idea, Talbot. Let's spend our last Halloween night scaring people to death. Frankenstein said, Friend idea, good. Talbot said, even though the moon's not, fall, not full, I can hide under beds and grab people as they walk by. I can turn into a bat and attack the unsuspecting. <coughs> Frankenstein hide in closet, said Frankenstein. People hear noise, open the door, Frankenstein grab them and break them to pieces. So Talbot poured three more glasses of cognac, raising his said, Here's to the people scared of the boogeyman in closets and under beds and outside windows. Here's to those who remember the horror that Halloween is meant to bring. And here's to the old monsters 
who will be waiting for people when they get home tonight. <laughs> Thank you all for being here. Let's give a big round of, round of applause, or a round of applause, to Van for putting this together.